as I said, good morning, everyone. Um, let me just get set up quickly. But uh, we're going to be starting this morning a series looking at stewardship and generosity. Uh, and uh, I want to be sharing with you really a journey that God took me on personally a couple of years ago. Um, and, uh, and I really believe God is going to minister to us this morning and challenge us. Um, there are going to be things that I'm going to say that will make you want to go back to the Word and be able to check it. Amen? That's good, because you've got to be in the Word. Uh, we've got to know that what God says is in the Word, what He is, has for us, is based out of His Word. Um, and so I want to firstly start by talking about, we're going to be looking at the keys to a blessed life, but I want to share with you that when it comes to this message, this is not something that honestly was natural to me. I am by nature, I will have a confession moment here, I am by nature not a generous person. Um, it sort of came down my family heritage, I'm just telling you the truth, and so I want, I want you to understand that when I'm sharing these principles of what God did in my life, it's not because this comes naturally to me. In fact, my wife is the generous one between the two of us. For those who know us, you'll know what I'm talking about. Jackie is phenomenally generous. And, and I feel like I actually have a right to speak on this because it's a little bit like, you know, when, you, when, when sometimes you hear someone who's a prophet speaking about hearing God's voice. And, and I sort of think to myself, but you've been hearing his voice since you were like three years old. You have these visitations, like angels appearing in your room, and you're trying to tell me who is like wrestling with this thing how to hear his voice, right? So I think in a similar way, sometimes it's good to hear from someone who's had to wrestle it through, where it's not a second nature, but I've had to learn principles and be challenged by God in this area. And it actually all started in 2020, that wonderful year that we all had in 2020. I mean, I know you guys look back and you're like, man, it was such a wonderful year. And it literally happened in the middle of lockdown. And in the middle of lockdown, God challenged me, says, I want you to do a Bible study on finance. Looking at money, looking at what the Bible says, and just study it. Because you can go, and guys, I encourage you to do this because you can go and get a course on finance. We're doing a series here. All of this is great, but you know what is even better? Is to get in the Word yourself. Let the Word speak to you about what God's heart is in this area. Because you've got to have faith for yourself. You've got to see what He says in order for there to be an adjustment in your heart. Amen? So he said to me, he said, Stephen, I want you to do this Bible study on finance. And I can tell you now that at that moment in my life, my finance was not looking very good. I was looking at my bank account, I did not look blessed. I was looking at our ministry account, it was not looking very blessed. I was literally living like month to month, but you know the saying, there was more month than there was money? Like you're getting to sort of the 20th of the month and you're like, man, there's still another 10 days or whatever it is until I get paid. That's where I was. And now you had hit COVID. Where things are shutting down, businesses are shutting down, uncertainty about the future, all of this. And God says to me, study the word. And he starts to take me on this journey, and the first scripture he takes me to is Acts 20, verse 35. And it says the following. It says, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And I read the scripture, and Jesus said, well, God said to me, he said, who said this? It's in black and white there, just in case you're wondering. The words the Lord Jesus himself said, okay? So these are Jesus' words. It's not just, you know, the Apostle Paul's words. Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And he said, Stephen, what does a blessed life look like? According to my definition. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, 
A blessed life looks like someone who's giving. And this was the start of God having to unravel me because for me, a blessed life looked like, let me see my bank account first and I'll tell you if I'm blessed. Because I would tell you that a blessed life is when I'm having all my needs met and I'm making it to the end of the month and in fact, I've got all these savings set aside, then I'm really blessed. And my ministry is really blessed when we have income coming in and all these things are happening and he's like, that's not my definition. My definition of a blessed life is what is flowing through you. Because you can have money in your ministry bank account, but if it's not serving people and flowing through it, it's not blessed. Guys, we've got to, we've got to switch this around because we've got to see that God's kingdom is so often an upside down kingdom to how the world sees things. This is his definition of blessed. How many of the times do we look at our finances and we literally are like speaking a curse over ourselves and saying, I'm not blessed because we're looking at what's in our bank account and he's saying, but what flows through you? You can still be a blessing. You can still be someone who this flows through. And I'm going to be sharing with you keys of a blessed life, but key number one is that a generous life is a blessed life. A generous life is a blessed life. So God took me on that challenge and he said to me, he said, well, what are you going to do about it? Because when you do a Bible study, it's not so that you can get head knowledge, right? Come on. So when you read something and you have a revelation, he's like, well, act on it. So my faith was really strong in that moment, and I'm like, well, God, because you said I'm going to give 200 rand a month to someone else, all right? That's all I was like, that's where I was at. I'm like, okay, I will dip my foot into the water, and I signed up with three people to give 200 rand a month each to those. One was an evangelist, one was a ministry that worked with the homeless and the poor, and one was another ministry that worked with orphans and widows. And I'm like, okay, God, if that's what it means to be blessed, I'll do it. The following morning, I wake up and I get a message from one of our partners saying, hey, Stephen, God put it on my heart to increase our partnership with you. 200 rand a month. The exact same amount that I had chosen to give. And it was God saying, I got you. I got you. Do you trust me? I'm the one who is leading you in this. So, so I'm like, cool, you know, and I wrote down these things and I'm like, God, I got this. You and me, we're going to take this journey. And that afternoon, I get a phone call from one of my other partners who said, listen, I have just, I, I'm, I'm potentially being retrenched because of COVID and I might have to pull the partnership from you. This gentleman made up 12% of my salary. And how many of you know that's not a hallelujah, thank you Jesus moment? <laughs> and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. All the joy, all the excitement that had happened that morning of a 200 rand partner, I'm like, I don't care about that 200 rand partner anymore. I just found out about this thing and I went on it down. And this is what God said to me. He said to me, he said, Stephen, your partner phoning you has not changed my view of what I've been speaking to you about. And it was like he was putting me into this thing to test me. How will I respond? How will I respond in that moment? And I'd love to say that it was all a hallelujah moment from there, but I had to wrestle through all those hard things. It was a massive blow. So I went to the Lord in prayer about that and just continued to pray. Two hours later, a partner who had lapsed their partnership phoned me up. They were, and I'm just telling you this because I want you to journey with me. They used to give me 550, 550 rand a month as a partnership. They phoned me up two hours later saying, Stephen, God's put it on my heart to increase partnership with you by 200 rand. 
And again, God is saying, trust me. Do you trust me in this? And he was demonstrating to me that the principle of a generous life, when we decide to take that, and guys, it's a faith journey. When we talk about finance and money and that, it has to do with trusting him at the end of the day. Our work is not our source. He is our source. Amen? He is our source. He is the one who's going to provide. Now, will he use our work? Yes. But he'll also use many other ways. But he has to be our source. And here's the clincher. That partner never dropped off. It was actually, I believe, like an accusation of the enemy. It was thrown in my face to see what I would do with it. And you're going to have moments where a smoke screen comes in your way to see are you going to focus on him or are you focusing now on your circumstances? And I can tell you that as we go through this journey together as a spiritual family, that there are going to be moments where God's going to challenge you. I want you to give. I want you to be generous. And then a smoke screen will come across in front of you to say, yeah, but what about this? What about that? What about that? Focus on what he's saying. Focus on the journey that he's taking you on and trust him. Amen? So key number two for the blessed life is God will give seed to the sower. So as he took me on this journey, he started to show me some of the things. And this was a scripture that really I spent quite a bit of time meditating on. And I want you to read it, but this is how I want you to read the scripture. This is God's word. This is what he is saying. You see, sometimes we just glance over stuff and somehow the word has become just another book we read. But if we truly recognize that this is God Almighty speaking and declaring things over us, then we need to give it higher regard. So he says here, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Next one. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now, I have actually had people tell me that that does not have to do with money. And I'm like... How do you read that scripture and it doesn't have to do with money? If you go and read the whole chapter, it's about an offering for God's people. It wasn't a spiritual offering. It was a physical offering. So he's speaking about the fact that God is going to give seed to whom? To the sower. Is it seed to the believer? No. No. He gives seed to the sower. How do you become a sower? You sow. You can't have the title without you doing something. I'm going to break it down really basically, okay? So in order for you to get seed, you've got to be called a sower. In order to be called a sower, you've got to sow. What comes first? Sowing. So many of us, we pray, God, would you give us, give us the seed, please, God. And he's like, you've got to sow. You've got to, I'm not going to violate my word. I've said it right there. I'm going to supply seed to the sower. Are you sowing? Is this part of your life? The upside down kingdom. You want me to give you something? Well, what are you giving? And he started to unravel me because he's like, Stephen, you are a closed Cistern. You're, not, you're not letting it flow through you. When something, when water is closed up, it becomes a swamp. Nothing can live there, the Dead Sea, or that he wants it to be a gushing river. He wants to bless us. He wants us to walk in blessing, but he wants us to walk in a blessed lifestyle, which ultimately is that the nations, what's the Abrahamic blessing? That the nations will be blessed through you. Notice that. Right in the beginning, when God declares the Abrahamic blessing, we all say, well, we are sons of Abraham and all of this. We have the Abrahamic covenant and blessing. The Abrahamic blessing was ultimately that nations would be blessed through him. 
it will go through. God didn't want it to be, oh, wow, one man is so blessed, all of that. Yes, he was blessed. You go and read about how many servants. He had over 500 servants. This guy was blessed. But what he's remembered for is that God blessed nations through him. Let's not be remembered for how much we've got in the bank account. But will God remember you because of what you've blessed other people through you? Let's break that down a little bit more. So he gives seeds to the sower and then what? And bread for food. So when you sow, he will then give stuff for you. It's not that he's going to give you seed just so you to sow and sow and sow. You will also receive personally and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Next one. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. I'm like, God, I want to be able to walk in that. That's a promise. I want to get to the place where I can be generous on every occasion. I'm not there yet. But it is a promise that's there. And through us, who's this? Paul is speaking here to the Corinthian church. So he's saying, you're going to be generous to our ministry, but through us, will result in thanksgiving to God. God will ultimately be given praise. Why? Because some people chose to sow financially. Amen? Look at this one, John 6. So often we hold on to the seed. <laughs> we hold on to the very thing God's saying, would you let go of this thing? When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy food, uh, bread, for these people to eat? He asked us only to test them. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. I love it. Don't you love Jesus? He's got this. He's like, I want to see what the disciples are going to do with this moment. So I'm going to ask them a question. I already know what I'm going to do. But I want to see where their heart is. You know, I believe there are times that God asks us questions because he's testing our hearts. He already knows how he's going to come through, what he's going to do. But he's like, Stephen, what do you think about this situation here? He's inviting me into a place of, of partnering with him and co-laboring with him. But he does it through a question because he already knows what the answer is, but he wants to see what I partner with him. Because he needed the disciples' faith in that moment. He needed them to be on board and he wanted to stretch their faith. So he did it to test them and then look what happens. Philip answered him, eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. <laughs> and that's a lot of money. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. How, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Now, I want you to see what happens in the story. That you have 5,000 people is a moment of lack. Jesus knows what he's about to do, so he asks the questions to his disciples. They find a boy who has lunch. And I think about what it must be like to have been that boy. <laughs> you arrive because, hey, you heard Jesus might be doing some miracles today, and you arrive there, and your mom packed you a nice packed lunch for the day. And you're sitting and listening to Jesus, and one of his disciples walks up to you and has the audacity <laughs> to ask you for your lunch. I'm like, where's your lunch? Like, aren't you one of his disciples? Like, why, why are you coming to me? I mean, when it comes to, like, adults and their food is one thing, but how many of you have got kids? Like, don't mess with kids and their food. And this child has to, in that moment, make a decision. I don't know. 
maybe he was a little bit like the adults put a little bit of pressure on him. I don't know what it looked like. But in that moment, he had to make a decision. Do I give my lunch? Do I potentially step into a place of lack? Because how many of you know by handing over his lunch, it means he's not getting lunch? we got to bring it back to what actually happened. We know the end of the story. This boy didn't. All he knew is, Peter is asking me to give up my lunch. I'm going hungry today. This is not looking very good. And he chooses to hand over to Jesus what is of value to him. And Jesus multiplies it. And a whole community gets fed. And the question that I have is how often is there a lack in a community and God approaches us as that child and says, will you give up your lunch for him? Not knowing that just by giving up what can seem insignificant, because let's face it, that lunch is not feeding 5,000 people. So that boy can say, well, you know what? This might feed Peter. Enjoy it. (laughs) But it's definitely not feeding 5,000. But he chose to relinquish the control and chose to trust the one he's giving it to. And because of that act of obedience, a community was impacted. And the question I have is, The communities that God has placed us in. When God asked us the question, Stephen, would you surrender your lunch? Would you give into this place? Can I trust you to be generous? That we can turn around and make a decision in that moment where we answer no. Or we can say, Jesus, it makes no sense because I don't have a lot And this amount that I'm giving to you is not going to impact that community. And he's like, don't worry about that. That's not your responsibility. Just obey what I'm telling you to do. And when you do that, he has the ability to multiply it out and impact the whole community. And sometimes I think he's waiting for us just to say, it's not about me anymore, Jesus. I'll let it go. So key number three is that our generosity leads to community impact when placed in the hands of Jesus. Why does God go on and on about generosity? I mean, I was getting wrecked when I was doing this Bible study. Why does he go on and on about it? Because quite simply, it's who he is. It's who he is. He's not asking us to do something that he hasn't already done. In fact, the reason why he challenges us to be generous, can I be honest? I'm going to take a moment here. Guys, I'm not preaching this because we want you to give money. The reason why God was going after me three years ago in this area of generosity is because he's saying, Stephen, you've probably heard Bill say this, you are never more like me than when you're being generous. And if there's a part of me that is stingy, I was there, still am, he's working it out. But if there's a part of me that's stingy, then that's a part of me that doesn't look like him. And he's trying to work that out of me. He's trying to get me from a Stephen-focused life to being a life out, out there. You see, so often we've got two kingdoms. We've got our kingdom where we live for ourselves, we look after ourselves, we do all these things for ourselves, and we got God's kingdom, which is about other people, sacrificial love. The one is rooted in pride. Woo, we don't want to hear this message. At the root of stinginess is pride. Why? Well, how am I going to make it through this month? Well, is it all about you? I'm just being honest. So what God is doing is he's actually reaching in and he's saying, you know what, there's something that has to shift in your heart because it's all about you. But I thought you died to yourself. 
I thought that when you came to the cross, that you take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow him. But it sure sounds like when it comes to money, that you're not denying yourself. You might be saying, I follow you, Jesus, but when it comes to this area, you're not willing to do it. And guys, this is all the process he was taking me on. He's saying, Stephen, I'm addressing this thing in your life because it doesn't look like me. I am generous. It is who I am. So key number four is I need to be generous because he is calling me to be like him. He's calling me to be like him. Luke 12 verse 32 says, don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. For God so loved the world that he gave. Have you ever thought how perfect heaven is? Perfect. No lack. No suffering. Jesus had lived in that place for eternity. And he says, Jesus, he says to the Father, Father, I will go down there where there will be suffering, where I will be abused, I will be spat upon, and I'll ultimately die. But a heart of generosity is one that says, but I will do it. That's who he is. It's his nature. And it brings him great happiness to give us the kingdom. It brings God joy to give. How many of you know that there's joy in giving? It's how he's wired. So when we give, we are literally tapping into his DNA and we experience his pleasure when we give. It's amazing that so often God's answer to a place of poverty, what we're feeling in our hearts, even things like depression, things like this, God's answer to it is give. This was something that I was like, man, I struggle with. And I'm going to read a scripture to you that, again, comes from the lips of Jesus, not from me. I want to clarify that. Luke 12, verse 22. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. And then it carries on, but in verse 29. And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things. And your Father knows what you need them. But seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you, okay? We all know that scripture, right? Look at the next one. We've just touched on it, but it carries on. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. And I'm reading this, and I see, again, if you know, if you know about hermeneutics, in context, in context, in context, What is the context of the scripture? Jesus is addressing his disciples about worry. They're worrying about life. They're worrying about provision. So they're in a place where they're like, I don't know what I'm going to wear, what I'm going to eat. And he says, don't worry about that. The pagan world runs after it. And he doesn't discount the fact that they're in that place. So they're in that place. They are worrying. They are anxious. And you know what he turns around and says them to do? Sell your possessions, give to the poor. And I'm like, that has got to be the craziest thing. Because I tell you what, I'm going to be honest here. That if there was someone who was in in utmost need, who came here, and you heard me as a pastor say to that person, listen, I recognize what you're going through, but right now what you need to do is don't be anxious. I want you to go home, sell all your possessions, and give it to someone poorer than you. That would make the newspaper, we'd have people coming in here, how dare you say such a thing, all of this. But that is what Jesus himself said. And I'm, and I'm reading all of these things, and I'm like, man, God, have we become so me-focused that even when it comes to finances, 
We've, we've, we've preached a gospel that it's sowing in order to reap. Now the truth is there that when you sow, you will reap. But ultimately, he's trying to root out from us a stinginess. That he should be able to see our lives that we would be willing to sow even if we didn't reap. Now when Jesus sowed his life, he reaped sons and daughters. Amen? So he's faithful. He's a good father. He's not going to leave you on his own. He says that right there. But what I'm getting at is at the root of it, he's trying to get us out of our own little worlds, our own little shells. And so often we're in a place of worry. We're in a place of anxiety. And he's given us the answer right there. And we think it's about, well, I'll get out of this place of being, not being anxious and not worrying if I just save a little bit more, if I go and see a counselor, if I go and do all these things. And he's like, take your eyes off yourself and why don't you give? And that makes no sense to me, God. Why would I give when I'm in a place of lack? And he's like, because I know that it's the key to unlocking what's holding you. Maybe we need to trust that God knows better than we do. And that's why we got to come back, God, is this what you have said or is this man's idea? This is what he has said. Psalm 35 is 27. May those shout for joy and rejoice who take delight in my vindication and may they say continually, the Lord be exalted who delights in the prosperity of his servants. And I want you to see that we've got to get to a place of truly believing that as a father, as a heavenly father who has the cattle on a thousand hills, who has all provision in heaven, that that's his heart towards us. Because when we're in a place where we're struggling, the enemy will come and say, no, no, no well, the, you know, God's not going to really help you in this. No, God delights in your prosperity. He delights to see you prospering. So he's not asking you to give because he wants to take away. He's asking you to give because he's saying, I'm dealing with your heart, but my heart is to prosper you. These are the keys. So a blessed life is ultimately one that flows from you. You see, when we shift our focus from being generous to getting money back. I'm going to sow so I can get back. Ultimately, it's pride. And can, can God, here's a question. You answer it yourself. Can God truly bless something that's rooted in pride? Answer that yourself. But when we give because our heart is the heart of a father, when we give because we trust him, and we know that at the end of the day, he will be our provider, then suddenly he can partner with that. Because you coming along with his heart, you are seeing the person, you're not giving because it's like, man, I need to give so I can get. You're seeing a need, and God the Father says, will you be the one who meets that need? And when you answer it because you say, God, I know you will provide for me. I have faith in you, and I see that need. I have the heart that you have for that person. And suddenly you give into that situation. God says, I can bless that. I can bless that. So here's my challenge for us as a family. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be touching on a couple of these areas. Lean into it. So often when it comes to talking about money, we want to disconnect ourselves from it. But it's one of the most important messages we've got to hear because we've got to hear his heart. We've got to get his heart. Lean into the message. Lean into what's happening. I really want to challenge you. Do a Bible study on it. Go through the scriptures. Don't let it just be what I'm saying. There's so much more. I, I literally created a 40-day devotional out of this thing that God took me through with the scriptures. There is so much in the Bible. Repent of incorrect thinking. I had to do a lot of repentance over those weeks. Locked up in my little house, <laughs> 
barring going to Fasanta Call to hand out food, there was a lot of time on my hands to really be focusing on what God was saying through this and repenting and saying, God, can I see things the way you see them? Can you change my heart to be like you? And then here's a challenge. I challenge you to test him in this. He actually, it's the one place in the Bible that it says, test me in this, is when it comes to finance and giving. Malachi 3.10. It says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Okay? So for me, that first step was, as I said, it was just putting my toe in. God's like, well, what are you going to do? Start by just sowing a seed somewhere. And what I ended up doing is I actually wrote this out. And this wasn't for me to, you know, publicly do it. You know, the Bible does talk about let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. All right? So this isn't, this isn't for you to go and put it on Facebook. <laughs> But what it is, and this is why God did it for me, is he said, Stephen, so often we sow, we scatter our seed, and we never actually take, um, what, what's the, take stock, that's what I was looking at. So often we don't actually take stock of the amount of times that God gives us a breakthrough because we sowed. And then the enemy comes back later, and he's like, yeah, you see, it's pointless, what are you doing? So what he said is, why don't you trust me? So I put down the date, the amount given. And then I got the column on the right-hand side, and when I started to see God come through in areas, like those testimonies that I shared, I would write the date and the testimony. Why? Because I'm also saying, God, you said test me in this. So when I'm sowing, I do expect that there will be a testimony that comes out of this. I trust you for that. Okay? He says that when we give to the poor, we're lending to God. So I hold that. If you don't know these scriptures, these are the things you need to know. So if he promises that, that's something we can hold him to. So it's like, God, okay, I've been generous to the poor. We're in a place now as a family. We have need. Would you come through? Amen. And I just started doing this. And you wouldn't believe the testimonies that we got out of it. So I did this for that period of 40 days. I didn't realize we'd been locked down for so long, but we were. And then God said to me, he said, now I want you to do this as a course. And I'm like, God, I haven't even gotten to the place where I feel like I've got total freedom. And he's like, well, I didn't ask you whether you had total freedom. I said, please, will you do it as a course? So I'm like, okay. And I sort of said, hey, guys, listen, I'm on a journey with the Lord. If you would like to join me on Zoom for this course that I'm doing. And I had about eight people who then decided to do it. And I took them through 40 days of um, we're there to get into the scripture themselves. And I'd written some stuff. And then once a week, we had a Zoom call where I was challenging them along this line. And you know that after doing it on um, two periods of 40 days, we had one lady write in that her salary was trebled. This is during COVID. Her salary was trebled in that time. We had another person who had a wedding dress completely paid off. Someone contacted them and said, we want to pay for your wedding dress, completely paid. We had another person who was a farmer who, um, whose bull, unfortunately, the only bull they had was infertile. And another farmer next door to them said, I want to give you a bull. Gave them a bull free. If you know anything about farming, that's not cheap. Um, was totally given. Um, but here was a beautiful thing. Through it, we had two ministries start to the poor. And, and I looked at that and I'm like, God, there, there, right there. That's the blessed life. Because yes, the testimonies are great about the salary was increased and God will do that as the byproduct. But what truly came out was people's hearts were touched to say, you know what, I'm going to be generous. And I'm actually going to start a ministry looking after the poor. I'm going to start a ministry serving people. And whatever that looks like, we're not all here to sign up for the poor. But what I'm challenging you is that as we go on this journey, what does it look like to carry his heart? his heart of generosity, his heart for people, that when he says, you know what, I'm going to be your provider, that we recognize that because he's the provider, he also has say over our finances. 
And sometimes we've got to give him that authority because we've taken that authority. And he's, he's got to have permission to say, Stephen, I need you to do X, Y, Z, and that we are willing to do that. So here's what I want to do. I want to pray for you. But I want to pray specifically for, um, for a group of people. I want to pray for you if you're feeling like there's a heart shift that God has been making, even in this time, where you're needing to respond to that. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. This is between you and God. But I feel like there's a response to him. To say, God, I recognize it. And I want to actually respond to that. For some of you, there might be a place where he's asking you to actually have an action step to that. And again, I'm not asking you what that is. That's between you and him. But if, he is, if he's challenging you, take that step. Don't leave here. Listen, because what the enemy will do is God will challenge you on something and you have, oh, I'll get around to it later. The enemy will come and he'll try and steal that seed. So make a decision. If you need to chat to your spouse or chat to someone and say, this is what I feel like God's wanting me to do, make that decision publicly with that person so that you're accountable for it. Amen? But that's what I want to pray for. And then the last thing I want to pray is I want to pray for you if you are in a place where you feel financially you are stuck. You just are like, I need a breakthrough. Uh, that's, that's a third group of people. So I want to start with the third group, and then I'm going to pray for the people who you want to respond to just what the Holy Spirit is saying. So if you're in that place, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because I know it's, it is private. But if you're in a place where you just need that breakthrough financially, you feel stuck, you feel like you're in a rut. I want to pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for every person here. I thank you, God, that you are our provider. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are the one who demonstrates generosity. And I pray for every single one of your sons and daughters. I thank you that you said, Jesus, that we do not need to worry, we do not need to be anxious, that our Father in heaven knows how to provide. And so I pray for every person who needs provision, every person who needs a breakthrough financially in their lives, Father, who has felt like they're just in this place, they can't get out. I pray supernatural breakthrough over their lives, Father. I pray for job provisions, Father, that you would even give promotions in this time, Father. That, Father, that those people who are just needing that job, that you would provide a way for them. You said, Father, do not forget the Lord your God who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so I just thank you that we don't forget you, that you give us the ability. And so every talent, every gifting that's in this room, that, God, that it will be used to bring provision for every person here, God. And so I pray that. And now I want to pray for those first two groups where it might be that you need to respond in your heart or it might be that God is actually speaking to you about doing an action. But I want you to make the statements in front of Him. God, today, can you repeat this with me? Say, God, today, I choose to respond to what I feel you are saying. Whether it's in my heart or whether it's in action. I pray, Father, that I would carry a generous heart like you are. And so, Father, I just pray for every single person here. We thank you. We thank you, Father, that you're not asking us to do something you didn't do yourself. We thank you that you are generous. We thank you, God, that you gave more than we could ever give, Father. So, Father, may our generosity, like that scripture says, may it ultimately bring glory to you, Father. May our communities be changed. May people's lives be touched. And, Father, as you said to Abraham, you're still saying today, Father, that nations will be blessed through us. 
And so, Father, I just pray that over every person here, that the blessing of God would rest upon them, Father. I release a blessing right now over their lives, Father, a blessing that would touch them, a blessing that would flow through them, God, that their workplace would be blessed, their families would be blessed, their communities would be blessed, Father, as they walk in supernatural provision that you have for them. So I thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. God bless you. We do have, if you are needing any extra prayer, we do have our love team that will be willing to pray for you. Um, please continue to come. We're going to continue the series. In the next coming weeks, we're going to be looking at some practicals as well because the Bible speaks very practically about stewardship, what to do with finance. Uh, so invite your friends. We have tea and coffee. Have a great rest of your Sunday. God bless you.